your Bibles with you this evening, would you open them to the first psalm and then to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, to the Sermon on the Mount. Stand with me as we read from Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. First of all, it says this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And then from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the beginning of it, the Sermon on the Mount, we begin reading at verse 1, what I'm sure will be familiar verses to you. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word by our head. As always, Lord, we're grateful for your word. These words are precious, and we pray that you will speak to us as we think about them this evening. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I recently heard someone on a Christian television program ask this question to the person who was in charge of the program. Simply said, how can I get blessed? That was the question. How can I get blessed? This particular program told them that if they sent in so much money, <laughs> which was the prescribed amount to get blessed that day, that God surely would bless them with much more than what they sent in. I kid you not. It's what they said. There are a lot of people today running from church to church looking for some kind of magical formula or for that magical church where they will get, quote, blessed. Unfortunately to me though it looks like there are more people interested in being blessed than are interested in discovering the one from whom all blessings flow. Amen. The book of Psalms that we read opened with those beautiful words, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That verse is kind of the keynote of the Psalms. And in one sense, you could kind of look at that as the keynote of the entire Bible. I suppose that it should not come as a surprise to any of us that Jesus would open his most famous sermon the Sermon on the Mount, with very similar words to what those of the psalmist. As he said, blessed are you, or blessed are they, 
however many times he said that in there. I didn't count them, but there was quite a few. What he was saying is that if you want God's blessing to show up in your life, Jesus didn't say send him so much money. <laughs> Praise God. Sir. Amen is right. He didn't say there was a magical formula or a magical church or a magical preacher that would somehow succeed in blessing you. He said if you really want God's blessing, then He would tell us how to be blessed and, and who it is that will be blessed. And that's what He does in these verses. And I think you already all got the hint and I think you already know being blessed doesn't necessarily mean that a big dollar sign goes with Amen. the blessing. Amen. Often it is quite to the contrary, actually. We call verses 3 through 12 that we read there in the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes, which the word comes from the Latin word for blessed. These Beatitudes, as they are called, could be considered sort of a little, or a title page, really, in the, in the teachings of Jesus, just like the first verse in the book of the Psalms is. And I want us to look at them this evening. They tell us in no uncertain terms how we can be blessed. But they also represent signs of those who are truly Christ's disciples. They help identify for those, for us, rather those, upon whom God's blessing will ultimately rest. How much different these things that Jesus lists are from the way the carnal mind thinks, for instance which is driven by sight and lust. And it looks to all kinds of different ways than these to somehow try to achieve happiness. The carnal mind, it thinks happiness comes from desiring to possess things. Stuff. <laughs> or from getting power somehow or, or social standing. Because it thinks that happiness resides in those things. But Jesus tells us that these spiritual qualities are what will bring about blessing or real happiness in our lives. As you think about these qualities this evening, replace the word blessed with the word happy even though happy is not a correct translation of the text. But that's usually what people were looking for when they're looking for blessing. They're saying, I want something to make me happy. The same things do not always make everybody happy. And we can certainly rule out the one about mourning there as something that will make you happy. Blessed are those that mourn. That's probably not going to make you happy. But Jesus shows us in these things not what people feel like or what they want, but what God thinks of them. People with these qualities gain His approval. And so I think it's just logically to say that if God approves of you, well then you're going to be blessed by Him. But God's blessing is far broader and exceedingly more important than simply just being happy. But I guess that tells you just how shallow the American church is these days. Because if you were to ask them what they really want more than anything else from God, it would be, I want to be happy. Shallow. Yet, you know more people who strive for happiness than what strive to receive God's blessing. I'm sure you do. 
Jesus began by saying, blessed or happy, if you want to use that, are the poor in spirit. He said here that the kingdom of God actually belongs to the poor in spirit. Actually, the first step we must take towards God is to confess our own personal spiritual poverty. We can't get any spiritual help in the court of heaven until we file bankruptcy papers there and acknowledge that we, in and of ourselves, have no spiritual assets. It is only as we acknowledge that to God that we will begin the process of God being able to bless us. The poor in spirit are actually those who recognize their dire state and because of it they see themselves as being somewhat helpless. The poor in spirit after recognizing their helpless state then they cling to their faith and they cling to their God. Remember, that's what the president said a number of years ago, we here in central Pennsylvania were doing. Uh, well, that's what the poor in spirit do. And when you do that, God then meets their needs. While the arrogant and the self-reliant see themselves as seeing nothing and needing nothing, including God. The poor in spirit. Secondly, Jesus said, Blessed or happy are they that mourn. Now, I already alluded to the fact that not all people who mourn should consider themselves fortunate. But those who mourn for the right reasons do find themselves in a desirable state as far as God is concerned. Whenever we realize that we are dead broke spiritually, what it should cause us to do is to simply mourn over our own personal condition. Anybody here get saved until you actually mourned over your own poor spiritual condition in God's sight. Whenever we acknowledge that, we then can find the comfort of His forgiveness. And whenever we mourn because of the loss of, say, a loved one or somebody like that or something like that, Jesus says to us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Believe also in me. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, burdened, you that mourn, I'll give you rest. And I hope that you know that Jesus can comfort like no one else can when you have reason to mourn. Surely by now most of you have discovered that. If you haven't by now, I hope when the time comes when you really mourn, you will discover it and you will know it that he'll be there. Thirdly, Jesus said, blessed or happy, again, are the meek. That's actually not the first time that is said in Scripture. Psalm 37, 11 echoes Jesus by saying, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Zephaniah 2.3 says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger, if you will seek this meekness they're talking about. What is meekness? Does that mean you're a wimp? It's strength uh, under control. <laughs> True meekness is submissiveness to God's will. Amen. The meek do not 
demand that their rights be considered. You know, a lot of people today that are fighting for their rights. The meek don't demand that their rights be considered. The meek can even afford to miss some things here and now. Why? Because Jesus says they're eventually going to inherit the whole earth. But there's also a real sense in which the meek actually inherit the earth right now. The meek often enjoy God's world of nature more than the rich do who pay taxes on it. The beauty of nature has been called God's unassessed real estate. Doesn't cost you anything to stick your nose out the door and look at the sunset in the evening. Doesn't cost you anything to walk out, even if it's a weed with a beautiful flower on it, and enjoy that beautiful flower. Doesn't cost you anything except a little time and a little attention. What I'm trying to get at is the fact that it doesn't take much to satisfy the needs of the meek in spirit. But the arrogant and those that want it all, they're never satisfied. The more you get, the more you want. But not with the meek. And the good news is they'll inherit the earth. Fourthly, Jesus said, Blessed are happy are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now there's kind of a little... Uh, Kind of this follows along here. Think about this. When we recognize our own spiritual poverty, and when we have mourned over our sins, we find the comfort of His forgiveness. This makes us humble or meek, for we realize it is all of God and not of ourselves. And whenever we get to that point, if we are truly the children of God, we will develop a, an endless hunger and thirst for Him and for His righteousness. To hunger and thirst after righteousness suggests an intense yearning to actually be righteous. Whenever you yearn like Jesus is describing, he then says, you'll be filled. The Greek word there for filled means to be filled with grass. Not marijuana. But grass like you would find out in a field. The picture that is portrayed there is that of cows or sheep or whatever grazing in the grass until they are full. And whenever they are full, they then lay down and they are satisfied. Actually, the same Greek word was used in connection with the feeding of the 5,000. In Matthew 14, 20, where Jesus said, or where it says, Actually, he didn't say that, but it says, and they did all eat and were filled, it says. Whenever we really hunger and thirst after God's holiness and God's righteousness, we then will be filled with his Holy Spirit. And the reason, and this is the only reason, that some people around the church will never be filled with the Spirit is because they do not hunger and thirst after God's holiness and righteousness enough. Oh, they say they do. But they don't think coming to church is important. 
If you were to really get down to the nitty gritty with them, they probably couldn't tell you the last time they actually prayed for five minutes. I mean, that's really hungering and thirsting, isn't it? Five minutes. If we really want to be filled with the presence of God and with His Holy Spirit and with all of His blessings, we've got a hunger and thirst after it. We've got to yearn for it and desire it more than anything else. Fifthly, Jesus said, blessed or happy are the merciful. And whenever we come to realize, and some people never do, but whenever we come to realize just how merciful God has been to us, it should cause us to want to be merciful to other people as well. Some people, even when they're getting saved, they think, well, I deserve this. I've actually had people in this church in the last 22 years actually tell me that. That when they prayed, they felt like they actually deserved this. Who deserves God's mercy? I can't think of anybody. But when we come to realize just how merciful God has been to us, it should cause us to want to be merciful to others. Then and only then will we then find mercy from Him. Remember, He said if you won't forgive somebody else, forget about me forgiving you. To be merciful means to show compassion, sympathy, pity, forgiveness, all things that Christians should show. But the word used there for mercy means far more than just sympathizing with someone or feeling sorry for them. It means having the ability to get inside the other person's skin until you have the ability to see things with his eyes, to think things with his mind, to feel things with his feelings. Even though the American Indians were pagans, I think that was kind of the idea they had in mind about don't judge somebody until you walked in their moccasins. <laughs> Whenever you can do that, you can walk in somebody else's moccasins, so to speak, and really begin to comprehend what they're feeling, what they're going through. Well, then you'll truly be able to sympathize like Jesus does. And then you can't help but be merciful yourself. Sixthly, Jesus said, blessed or happy, again, are the pure in heart. Now you know there are some that say your heart can never be pure. But if you couldn't have a pure heart, then why would Jesus talk about having one? That would be foolishness. Of course we can only have a pure heart if we've had our hearts cleansed from sin by and through the blood of Jesus. We don't have a pure heart by ourselves. Our heart is desperately wicked, the Bible says. But when Jesus cleanses our heart, it can be pure. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. We're told here by Jesus that we must allow God to cleanse our heart from sin if we ever expect to meet God in heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Know what it said? But there's another clear truth that we must not miss here. It's not just heaven. We can only see God clearly in the here and now if our hearts have been made clean and pure. Because sin 
always has a way of obscuring our spiritual view. Always. It obscures our spiritual vision. To have a pure heart is to have the single eye that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6.22. A pure heart is a heart that has been filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the love of God. When you have that, Jesus said, you'll be able to see God. Not only someday in heaven, but experience Him here and now in the fullest. Seventhly, Jesus said, blessed or happy are the peacemakers. That doesn't just necessarily mean on the national or international scene, but the peacemakers in our community, in our church, and and especially in our homes. Peacemakers are people who promote good relationships with and among others. They do not incite quarrels. They do not stir up strife. They are not the cause of disputes. But they seek to help others to reconcile with each other by using their influence to resolve differences and by helping others to see how to better understand those that are at odds with them. Jesus said peacemakers are called the children of God because they act like their father. If I were to ask your family which are you, a peacemaker in the family? If I go to that family reunion and say, how do you look at them? Are they a peacemaker or are they the one that's always stirring up the strife? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. Finally, Jesus said, blessed or happy are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I suspect there's a lot of people in Iraq and Syria and places right now that that verse is much more precious to them than it is to you and I this evening. Amen. We must make sure whenever we talk about persecution, though, that we get to that part about for righteousness' sake. Those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Because some people will end up being persecuted for their own foolishness. But when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake, we've entered into a desirable state. Because our suffering is for the right reason. One thing to suffer because of your own stupidity. It's another thing to suffer for the right reason. Now I personally have yet to find it to be pleasant to be persecuted or to be spoken about in an abusive manner. I, I have yet to find that to be a pleasurable experience. But Jesus says in verses 11 and 12 that when we find ourselves being reviled or persecuted or maligned for the sake of God's Son, He said, yeah, it might not be pleasurable to you, but you are fortunate. Why would he say we should rejoice and be exceeding glad? Because what we are facing is a sign that we are divinely approved of. We're persecuted because God approves of us. And so there's reason there to rejoice even in the midst of persecution. For Jesus says our reward in heaven will be great. Amen. There is such a thing as a martyr's crown. There aren't very many crowns, but the martyr's crown is one that many will receive. To give us further assurance of this approved standing in the sight of the Father, Jesus says is the fact that guys like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah and all the rest 
to the Hebrew prophets. They all experienced perhaps the same kind of persecution. Maybe you're experiencing as well. Matter of fact, Paul declared in 2 Timothy 3.12 that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not just people in Iraq, but all who will attempt to live a godly life through Christ Jesus, somebody's going to give you a rough time. Now, Christians in America probably have experienced less persecution than any place in the rest of the world. In the history of the world, actually. But mark my word, our time is coming if the Lord tarries long enough. And you can see it coming more and more each day. Where we're going to be looked at as more and more as the bad guy. Blamed for all the problems of the country and persecuted. So we better get ready if the Lord tarries. Jesus shared quite a mouthful in these words that we call the Beatitudes. A lot to ponder there. Maybe even for this week, and I challenge you to ponder them. Maybe you ought to challenge yourself to try to live this week as they all tell us that we should live. And if we do that, well, the promise is we'll be blessed. Maybe we won't get a hundred dollar bill, but there are many ways to be blessed. God knows how to do it. Now, I challenge you to think about this that this week and to challenge yourself to ask yourself how close am I living to these things? You want to be blessed, don't you? I mean, we all should want to be blessed. The guy on that TV program wanted to know how to get blessed. Well, here's how. Jesus spelled it out very clearly for us. This is how we'll be blessed if we follow these things. Let's join together in a closing word of prayer.